Hi. Yep. Oh, hi. <laughs> Do you come here often? <laughs> Sorry, that was like the creepiest way to start this off. <laughs> off on a bed, but let's start over. All right. Hi. Hi. That was very moving. It's a bit hard to talk after that. The response and the reaction to what you guys do and your TED talk and tonight, it is extraordinary. You have to experience it. Um, tonight was incredibly moving. There was rebellion, revolution, bravery, love, tenderness, joy, heartbreak. Do you want a job as a publicist? It's all right. <laughs> okay. I'm very good. <laughs> um, I suppose that's pretty unusual to experience in a group environment. And you are rock star poets because the reaction to your work has been extraordinary. How do you explain it? Um, well, we definitely don't take it for granted. I think that we are incredibly lucky that a room full of people will take time out of their lives to come and listen to us. Um, that, on a very basic level, is something that I'm very thankful for on a daily basis. Um, in terms of the response, I I'm not surprised by people's being moved by the art form because I grew up being moved by the art form. I was surrounded by incredible poets and would have the wind knocked out of me on a weekly basis and would go home stunned um, and experiencing joy and terror and sadness and all of that. Um, so I know that. I know that feeling because I've had it from other rock star poets who I would really call rock star poets. Um, you know, I don't think that what we're doing is anything more remarkable than what a lot of other poets are doing. I think that we have been very, very blessed and very fortunate to be given the opportunity to go perhaps farther away from home um, than a lot of other poets get the chance to do. Um, so I think more than anything, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that people are discovering the magic of spoken word poetry. And if you're discovering it through us, then that's a great gift you've given us. But we hope we're the gateway drug and you go and find other poets to follow as well because we are just two people in a very big ocean of, of poets. I suppose that the deeper point is that Text messages, bad language, like shortening, everything's shorter, quicker, faster. And, some, and I believe in what you do in a really deep way and the experience tonight was incredibly meaningful. Why poetry? Like, it just seems like we're in a time that poetry wouldn't have any significance. It wouldn't mean anything to people. No one would get it. So... I don't have the magic answer. My, my, my best guess is, is that is in part why, why we're so lucky to get this reaction is because, you know, for one reason or another, we're, we're in a world where everything is short and everything is through a screen. Um, so to be in a room with someone sharing something, um, I think is always a powerful thing. I think still blows me away. You know, sometimes it's my sister or my father um, or Sarah, you know. Um, and so I think for us, it was really just this idea of, of bringing that into a little more formalized place um, and making that a little more sacred, hopefully, um, as an art form. Um, and, and we've been very lucky that, that people so far so good. Um, I suppose that you were talking about your influence and the fact that you had that instinct that you were inspired really young. So you figured there'd be a whole lot of other people that would respond to the vulnerability and the and the openness of poetry, like you did. Um, when, for both of you, the question is asked, when did you find your voice? <sighs> um, yeah, right. Well, the, the relatively short answer is I first saw spoken word poetry for the first time. I was 17 years old. Um, I saw it uh, at, in a big theater. It was actually a big talent show of other kids my age, and I saw it for the first time, and it was just like, that's... That's it, that's awesome. Um, and it was a pretty s simple realization. I really just went home and started writing. Um, and that's what it was. And, and Sarah and I joke around, you know, Sarah, I'm sure she'll talk to it, but had a lot more poetry to go to in, in New York. You know, I grew up in Orange County where all good art goes to die. And um, <laughs> so it was a lot more, 
kind of incubated, in, which in some way was nice, in some ways was, was even more important to my finding of that voice. Um, in terms of the voice finding, I think I'm, I'm still doing it. You know, I'm, we're 23, you're 24, I'm 23. Whatever. <laughs> we're like, we're like the best looking 65 year olds you've yeah, ever baby. seen. Yeah, <laughs> um, No, um, I, at least I won't speak for Phil. For me, I feel very young and I feel like I have a lot of learning and growing to do. Um, I did grow up around a lot of influences, and those influences leak in when I'm not expecting them, and I'll say something and I'll go, that's not my voice at all, that's somebody else's voice, and then I'll have to go find which poet it is I'm ripping off, and I have to go. Anyone we should know about? Yeah, right? Um, not off the top of my head, um, but, it, but it happens often, and that, that's the difference, is that Phil grew up around you know, n no other big influences, so he found it found his voice very early, I think. I grew up around so many influences that I was able to go, okay, this works, this works, I can't do that, I don't understand that, that worked, you know, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, it would be a different journey trying not to imitate. In totally, that, yeah. totally. Um, and I'm still figuring that out. Also, it would be weird if I had the same voice when I was 15 as I did when I was 23. That would be concerning. Um, so <laughs> my voice is changing on a daily basis, and that's one of the reasons why I love Writing spoken word poetry is because I try to write from where I am right now, so that later on, when I go back and look at that poem, it's almost like a photograph of myself in that moment. Um, and I've revisited poems that I wrote you know, a long time ago, and my relationship to the words change, my relationship to myself changes, and that's really exciting. That's really, it helps me learn. I was just, this is total sidebar, I was just thinking as a Jewish mother, that the whole thing of like, we're never gonna get married and I'm just, the poem was amazing and I'm just saying. <laughs> well, I have a funny story. Have you heard of Nachas? Do you know what Nachas is? Oh, I know what Nachas yeah, is. Yeah, that was Nachas. <laughs> Nachas is a Yiddish word for like, heartwarming goodness. Get married, anyway. <laughs> My You're fired from your job. <laughs> <laughs> my mother, who has followed us closely, and you know, this has been ongoing for what? We've, we've known each other six years. And like three years ago, not to me, to Sarah, we went out to breakfast. We were in California on tour, and, and we went out, the three of us, and I like, go to the bathroom. And my mom like leans over the table and she goes, You know, you know, it's secret. I just hope you and Phil get married. I agree with her, I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway um. but here's what we tell people like we don't go into your home and say like hey you and your sister <laughs> like that would be weird and inappropriate right? Sarah and Phil thing <laughs> right yeah, well okay. yeah I mean it really is like discovering it is like discovering you have a sibling that you didn't know you had I'm making fun partially um, <laughs> because the tenderness and the love inside that particular poem where you preface it by saying you're never getting married, um, is, is extraordinary. Uh, people don't talk that way to each other. They don't admit it to themselves. And they certainly don't get up on stage and, and put that out there. He's like. Well, I mean, it's, it's funny you bring that up because that to us is just, you know, our relationship. But it is funny because I don't think we even realize, and, and people have caught on to that. We did a show at an all girls uh, elementary and middle school. And like we did the Q&A after, and literally like the first six questions. questions. No, it was like, wait, so you guys are married, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they literally had a vocabulary in that day. This is not a joke right before they saw us. And the vocabulary was plutonic. And they just couldn't, like, just yeah. couldn't wrap their heads around yeah. it. <laughs> so I think that's been its own funny, you know, chapter of this is like people really cling on to that. Um, as, as like an odd thing, which, which I guess it is. I don't know. It's not odd. It's inspiring. It's beautiful. Yeah, you're hired again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to just quickly talk about, have you talk about your a really amazing work with Project Voice. If you want to tell us a little bit about Project Voice. Sure. Um, Project Voice is the work that Phil and I do um, 
that has to do with education. So we say that Project Voice has three missions and they are entertainment, education, and inspiration. And so a lot of what that means is we go into schools or community centers or venues um, and we perform spoken word poetry just like we did. And then if we have the opportunity, we also go into classrooms and we teach workshops to students on how they can get started on this art form themselves. Yay, we want to do a workshop. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, amazing. And so what, if you can think of one amazing story of transformation that you saw in a student? Sure, I can tell you my favourite my favorite story from Project Voice and also my answer to the question, what's the best thing that's ever happened to you on stage? Because mm -hmm. they're the same story. Um, two years ago, Phil and I got invited to perform at a middle school. And at the time, we had never performed for a middle school. We never performed for an age group that young. It was going to be the what youngest group. What is it, um, America? Middle school is uh, like 12 to 14. Yeah. No, younger, younger than. Like the oldest was like 12. Yeah. So it was like 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds. And we were nervous about it because it was a Catholic, private, conservative, <laughs> middle school in Southern California. <laughs> and um, as an added bonus, the night before we were like figuring out what we wanted to do and the principal called and said, hey, we just want to double check that the set list is going to be appropriate for tomorrow. And we were like, yeah, yeah, the set list will be appropriate. Why? And he said, well, we've just had a bit of a, a language incident recently, so we're very sensitive to it. And Phil and I exchanged glances and Phil said, um, what was the language incident? And the principal said, well, one of our sixth graders um, said the word idiot. <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> we moved very quickly back to the drawing board. Um, but that's the side story. We ended up getting on stage, we did this performance, and when we're working in schools, very often during our performance, we'll pause and we'll ask if there's anybody in the audience who wants to get up on stage and perform a poem. Because you never know when there's a closet poet sitting there and this is their chance, this is their shot. Um, and so we asked, and of course no one wanted to get on stage because they had never seen anything like this before. We were their first introduction to the art form, and so no one did, which was fine. We continued with the set. Um, afterwards, people responded really positively. Teachers and students alike said they, they really enjoyed themselves. Great. We left. A year later, we were invited back to the school. And somehow, <laughs> we didn't mess it up. So they invited us back, and we were thrilled to go back again. So we came back a, a full year later, and we were performing our poems. And halfway through the set, I asked, is there anyone in the audience who wants to come up and perform a poem? And a boy in the second row like leapt onto the stage. He did not even raise his hand. He just like <laughs> jumped onto the stage and he was out of breath. And I said, you know, what's your name? And before he could give me his answer, he just said, I wrote this poem the day after you guys left last year and I've been waiting all year to share it with you. And we were just like, well, I guess we're doing something right. I um. I just want to talk to them. Um, <laughs> can we change the lighting? Because we really can't see the audience. And I'd love to let you guys ask questions. Is anybody there? <laughs> Everyone's already gone home. We yeah. just can't talk. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, baby. Hello. Ah, oh, good looking. <laughs> I'm wondering if I should. Have we got us oh, super organized? Have we got a microphone in the audience? No, we just do it without a mic. Okay. You'll just have to shout. Yep. Okay. Does anybody have a question? Yes. So, um, so I wanted to know, before we even start to wonder, what would you say in terms of whatever style, et cetera, the difference between spoken word here from what you've heard so far in the States? The question was, what is the difference between performing style here and in the States? Um, I weird, you know, I'm, I'm going to just shoot in the dark because we haven't been here long enough where I feel like I can really generalize. Um, there's a certain humility here that I've felt, not just in the poetry world, but in, in kind of the way of life both here and in New Zealand. Um, and I, I've found that pervasive throughout poetry as well, which I actually really enjoy. I think uh, I have trouble sometimes with poetry when it's when it's like trying to speak here down to here um so i i found that as well um i i don't i think that 
there's no common thread that I've noticed so far. I mean, there are different types of poets in the US. There are different types of poets here. You know, I haven't been here long enough to be like, oh, another one of those poets, you know. Um, another Vegemite poem. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. What is, what is the artistic process in writing a poem? Do you want to start? Uh, sure. I like to say that poetry is like pooping. <laughs> if there's a poem in you, it has to come out. <laughs> Sometimes it's very difficult. <laughs> And sometimes it's very easy. Um, <laughs> she looked much classier on you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, in terms of process, the only thing I can say about process is that I write poetry when I have something that I'm trying to figure out. Um, so when there's something I'm puzzling over and I can't navigate it any other way, that's when I decide to write, or that's when I have to write a poem. Um, I have to be completely alone when I write poetry. Um, Phil and I have noticed that there's this fantasy that some people have, that poets go to like a Starbucks and are just like, mm, they don't even look at what they're writing. They're like, the muse oh, just it's like gold, them, wow, yeah. look at that, it's amazing. Um, I can't do that because I can't be in public when I'm writing, because if I'm writing something I know is going to be performed, as I'm writing it, I have to hear what it sounds like out loud. I have to feel what it feels like in my body, um, which is why when I'm writing, I really have to, to be completely alone. Yeah, absolutely. I, and again, right, I think there's this belief that like it just comes, especially in the poetry world, I think there's this whole romanticism around the idea of the poet. Um, but it's, it's, it's tough. Um, in terms of concrete writing process, I think, you know, Part of it is, is learning, for us, has been learning these little moments of, of poetry that come at you um, and are usually in pretty, you know, dirty, non-glorious moments. Um, I, have a, I have a poem that's, uh, I mean, I have a poem about losing my virginity, right? <laughs> um, and that was me trying to think through that idea but, and like kind of pondering it and then forgetting about it, but instead of forgetting about it, just, just having that moment to write it down. Um, when it actually comes down to write, it's like any, any other work. You know, I love it, but it's like, I really need to sit myself down and be like, I need to finish four pages today, or I need to do this today, or I need to do that today. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of would-be amazing writers that like, it just doesn't flow out of them all in one go, and they feel like, well, that, I just must not be good at this, um, which is not the case, because in which case, almost every single writer I know would not be good at this. <laughs> yes. How did the last one about love come about? Um, Phil and I spend many hours in cars together, um, driving from place to place. And we were talking about kind of the evolution of the way that we thought about love. So when you're in seventh grade, you think that love is going to be awesome and wear a hemp necklace and play acoustic guitar. And like, that's it. And like, that's what love is. And then we were both laughing about how like the first time we respectively fell in love, how this person was actually totally different from what we thought love was gonna be like. And so then we were exploring, okay, well, what was love actually like? Um, and then what happened after that? What happened when that love went away? Uh, then what? Then what was the second love of your life like? Was it a little bit harder to be vulnerable? Was it a little bit scarier to realize that they had loved someone before they loved you? So we just, we had very different paths that we've been on, um, but it was, it was just really a conversation about the way that people think about love and how that evolves. Yes. Yeah, 
You know, it really doesn't. That's one of the funny, we rarely ever talk about physical performance. I think we, you know, it's like playing music together. Um, you know, when you play a song over so much, you get to know each other's rhythm, you know where someone's at. You know, I can, I can pretty distinctly feel where Sarah's at. Um, and uh, it's funny, we always perform in this, in this position with me on stage left and Sarah on stage right. So we just did a radio interview uh, and we were sitting, we were just like chatting and then they wanted us to perform a poem and like I quietly got up and Sarah immediately knew what I was doing. <laughs> and like sat over like, okay, we were now, in, now on gonna... radio. So like no one was going to see us, <laughs> right. but like we could not possibly be on the other side of each other. And you could just see the two DJs just like, I'm just, I'm just going to let this one go. <laughs> yeah, go for it, yes. Um, well, I don't like the coffee and the paper cup in Starbucks either. Um, but seriously, given the Japanese background in both of you, mm -hmm. what's your relationship to haiku? Mm -hmm. What's our relationship to? Haiku. Haiku. Oh, cool. Um, my Jewish father is the best damn haiku writer ever. Um, and he will write me haiku often, and we will share haiku together, and my mother will write some herself. Um, when I was growing up, I took my lunch to school every day from kindergarten through fourth year four. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> We're learning here in Melbourne. <laughs> Um, I took my lunch today, I took my lunch to school every day, and my mother or my father would write me a poem on a little post-it note and fold it and put it in my lunch every day for five years. Um, and it was often very short, like really Dr. Susie, um, silly, sometimes they rhymed, sometimes they didn't, but what it did was it made it so that poetry was always something I looked forward to. Um, it was always a surprise that I was expecting. Um, it was always uh, just a present, a gift. And that's kind of the way I think about poetry in general. And oftentimes, they were haiku because it allowed them to pack a punch into a very short amount of words. Right. Can you give us an example? <laughs> an example of a haiku or example of one of my parents' short poems? Um, my favorite short poem that my mother once wrote me in a lunchbox, I still have it tacked to my room, is um, a mouse can be brave, a lion can too, courage depends on what you have to do. My, uh, to make you feel better, that shit did not happen to me. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Any other questions? How much time do we have? One more, two more? Okay, like maybe one more? Yes. The question is, are there any other artists, musicians, poets, of any kind, um, artists, who we would ever want to collaborate with? Um, totally, yeah. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, no, we, uh, we obviously really enjoy doing collaborative work. It's really fun. There's an energy you get from another person that's really exciting. And we've both worked with other people as well. Um, and uh, enjoy that very much. Phil has worked with a really amazing fiddle player um, at one point. I, got to, I have a poem about India that I wrote, and I got to perform the poem with someone on sitar, which was awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so absolutely, there, there are poets. And we are collaborating with people all the time in, in our community and elsewhere. The problem is, in all honesty, um, just schedule-wise is always really difficult to find the time, especially when we're on tour. We're moving so fast um, that it's it's just hard to to f fit it all in. Yeah. A few more questions. Just like, yes, front row. Um, just, I've, I've discovered you guys through Def Jam and um, through Ted videos and stuff. I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas for like how you would Did that 
The question was, after exposure like Def Jam and TED Talks, did that change my writing? Um, I, right after TED, um, I was very scared to write anything ever again. Um, especially because I actually wrote B when I was, um, let's see, yeah, 19, I think. Um, so that was already a poem that was uh, kind of far away from me, and I like brought it back. Um, and I thought, I really had many times go, all right, well, that's it. I reached my peak, and now it's over. Now it, I've got nothing left. Um, and I think the trick is, someone, all, someone else recently asked, um, do you think, so, I think it was maybe Bob Dylan, I can't remember, so, but some, some musician once said that like, genius like, is really only in the young, that like, the older you get, the harder it is to have like, strokes of genius or something like that. And I don't at all believe that to be true. But what I do believe to be true is that the older you get, the harder it is to admit that you don't know what the hell is going on. When you're younger, it's a lot easier to be like, I don't know what the hell is going on. Let's write a poem about it, awesome. When you get older, you think that you should be writing poems that are like, now I know what's going on. Um, you know, that's, that's what it translates to in, in my head. And I was like, wait a second, wait a second. I still don't know what the hell is going on. Um, and I think it was harder for me to, to think that people would be okay with that, to, to think that people would allow me to still be 23 and still not know what I was going, to still be 40 and not know what's going on. It's hard to, to say that I, the poet who writes when I'm figuring things out, should not have like figured everything out by a certain point and therefore have no more poems to write. Um, so it was really hard at first. And then um, I started to realize that um, I'm going to have to write some bad poems still, and everyone's going to just have to deal with it. Um, and hopefully the bad poems will help me write good poems, and, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, I still constantly write bad poems. I'm not even joking. You know, I think it's, I've met so many people that are scared of their own writing, um, that write one bad poem and go, oh my gosh, I'm a, I'm a bad writer. And that's not the case at all. It means you're a great writer who wrote one bad poem. Um, and so that's been kind of a constant process to push through and understand. Yes. How do I know if a poem is good? That is a great question. Because I'll tell them when it sucks. <laughs> Um, that is honestly, it's, it's a really tough one. I mean, so we're lucky in that we have, you know, really it's, it's having people that you trust and, and respect, um, that can, that you can also, you know, take criticism from, which is a, which is a hard thing to do, um, even from the people you love. So I think that there's that mutual build and bond you get. And to, to some extent it's, it's being okay with doing something that, that fails. We're big believers in failure, um, and the importance of it. And I've had those shows where you try something out and everybody's like, yeah, that was great. You know, um, you know, that poem was really nice. And, and then you know. Um, and, then, and then it's more important to have someone who can really tell you, you know, what's just nice about that poem. Um, but you don't really know. It's a tough process. Also, we have an advantage because poets who write for the page, um, you write that poem down and you send it off into the world and you hope that it's good. Um, we write a poem and we put it up on its feet in front of a room full of people and they will sure as hell let you know if it's not good. Um, and that's great. That's a, that's a feedback tool that we absolutely use um, to, to help us learn what is working and what is not working. Two more questions. Gentlemen with head covering. We're working on it, okay? We're working on it. Outside the American voice. That's a really interesting question. Um, I went to an international school when I was growing up, and so I grew up speaking a very international English, which is different from American English. And then when I graduated 
high school and went to university, I was at a very American university surrounded by Americans almost exclusively, and my voice changed um, to be a very American sounding voice. And since coming, I was in Singapore before I came to Australia, and in Singapore especially, I found like, like an, a language you thought you forgotten but still know, my voice really changed into international English as soon as I got there. And I like called my family and they were like, what the heck? Why do you sound so weird? Um, so I think voice and especially, especially when you use your voice often, it is a changing instrument. Um, so there are times when I perform a poem and I'm performing for a room full of people who don't speak English fluently and I have to pronounce things and emphasize things differently and I'm aware of that and I think good performers should be aware of who is in the audience. You know, when we were, were getting ready to perform in Australia, I was quizzing Caroline about things. Do you guys have law and order here? She's like, yes. I was like, okay, do you, what, do you call it homeroom? Like, what is, what is, she was like, okay, all right, slow down. Like, a <laughs> lot of things are the same, and then here are the words that no one's gonna know. In one of the poems, I mentioned Providence, which is where we went to school, and she said, you know, I don't know if people are gonna know Providence, so I said, great. Let me, you know, for, for the purpose of that line, that's not important, this is important. So I'll change that to New York City, and then and people will understand the point of the line instead of getting tripped up. So yes is the, is the short answer. We are aware that American English is a language in its own right. Um, also, we can use it and not use it and change it and alter it as is necessary. Last question. Make it a good one, y'all. Dun, 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 dun. Yes. Um, it's, it's a little bit of both. So Sarah and I both write both page poetry and poetry to be performed. Um, I think for me, I like to create in the whatever is going to be the ultimate medium. So if I'm writing a poem for the page, I'm literally writing it and watching it and seeing how it plays together on the page. If it's a poem meant to be performed, I'm literally performing through it. I'm like trying out lines, seeing how they feel and my body up on their feet, and then kind of cutting them from there. Um, in terms of things are finalized, I have a terrible or great habit. Horrible <laughs> habit. Habit of constantly changing poems or slightly change, you know, like doing little tweaks and which is like fine when it's just me on stage. When it's the two of us, it's really <laughs> entertaining for me. Um, so no, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in not having, you know, poems quite done and you're, when you say lines over and over and over again, and a lot of it's exactly like we touched on before, it's not until you see something in front of an audience two or three times that you really get a sense of, of, of where the poem needs to be and what's working and what's not working. So there's definitely revision that happens after that process. I'm slightly different, only in that I had no background, Phil had started in theater as a actor and a performer, and then sort of came into writing a little bit later. I've always been a writer and had nothing to do with performance until spoken word poetry. I'm not an actor. I've never had acting practice. Um, so for me, the words are everything, and, and then comes the performance. So I almost never change words in a poem unless it's for clarity for my audience in one performance that I'm performing. So I'm very sensitive when I'm in a performance, who is in the room and how are they gonna have the best time? What can I do to make my performance as clear as possible for them? Um, and in that regard, yes, I will change words. But in terms of the, the poem itself, I very rarely will reword something after, after I've you know, said it. That's no fun. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to, I'm going to add this. So we are going to, Barry's going to close up with you guys, so don't move. Phil and I are going to escape before everyone goes rushing out. We're going to be standing outside the door. There's a little tiny table um, that has Dumbo Feather um, merchandise, and also we both have some books, but not many. So we're going to ask that if you want to buy one, at least for like, 
a little while, try to just have like one book per person, and then if we have more, you can hang out and get more. Um, but I'm worried that if someone comes and buys you know, five, then, then nobody else will get to have one. So we both do have books there. We also have t-shirts, um, which benefit Project Voice, and uh, they were created for us by one of Phil's close friends from home. Um, there's a line in the poem that we do about our friendship together, and the line says, I want to share every single one of your sunshines and save some for later. I will tuck them into my pockets so I can give them back to you when the rains fall hard. And so he um, designed a pocket of sky with a sun sitting inside of it um, for this t-shirt. So we have those as well if you want to come and get one. You also certainly don't have to buy anything. You can just come and say hello. We'd be happy to meet you. So that's what we're going to do. And now we're going to hand it over to Perry. We'll see you all out there. Thank you. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Thank you.